So I'm Dr. Matt Miller, and today I'm going to talk about um, testing network investigative techniques. Um, as you can see, I'm amazing. I can pull myself out of a drawer at times if I need to. Although the cable management in this situation, if you can see it, is not maybe the greatest, right? So I worked as a programmer for five years for a company that sells shower bases and lavatories. Um, at that time, I was working on my PhD. I got that from Kansas State University. And right now, I am a professor of computer science at the University of Nebraska at Kearney. And I'm one of the co-leaders of our cyber operations degree, which will start this fall. In addition to this, over the past four years or so, I've been an expert witness under the CJA, or Criminal Justice Act. I've worked on over a dozen uh, different cases. And he, some of my hobbies are parallel computing, reverse engineering, doing reverse engineering challenges, baseball, woodworking, all that fun stuff. So enough about me. All right, so this is a little bit of background on law enforcement get investigations. So you guys probably, if you ever watched something like Law and Order, right, you have some of the ideas of what goes on, right? So for example, we have wiretapping, right? So with the old phones, right, they actually would get on the poles, right, and connect the wires and listen into your conversations. Um, as we've moved into the digital age, right, we have websites, clearly, right, and so what um, website providers will have to provide our IP addresses. I don't know if anybody here has gotten a subpoena for somebody's I IP address. I don't think we have any ISPs here. But that is something that they will get issued subpoenas for, and they have to provide that information if they do have it. Um, and then we have peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, right? So in that case, right, you know the IP address of both parties, right, because the peers are talking um, in plain text. And then a second bit of background is search warrants. So a search warrant is issued by a judge, and judges have jurisdiction, which means they have a particular area where they are allowed to issue search warrants. So you don't have more than one judge issuing warrants uh, for the same area in the, in the U.S. Again, some more background. So we got different types of anonymization, right? So people get their IP addresses, right? They get this search warrant, and they say, well, I don't like that. Right, so what do we, they do? They try and add different um, techniques to mask their, their IP addresses. So we've got two different flavors generally. There might be more that I don't know about, but these are the two general ones. So we got I2P, or the Invisible Internet Project. That is maybe a little bit complicated for your average person to set up, right? So they don't typically use that. Now Tor offers their Tor browser bundle, which you just download that, right? And then you can get on the Tor network. And here's a diagram from the EFF on how, and the Tor website on, as to how Tor works. Right, so in general, Alice right here can browse the internet without Alice's IP address being exposed. But then she makes a plain connection, you see the red dotted line, to Bob's server. Right, so Bob still knows who, Al he, he doesn't know who Alice is, but we can go look up where Bob is, right? And if he's hosting illegal content, then we can issue a search warrant for Bob and take down his site. And people wanted to get around that. So then they invented hidden services. And so hidden services, basically the server and the client don't know who each other are. Right? You can't tell who is who. And so this sort of breaks down law enforcement's model, right? Of, OK, I get an IP address. I get a search warrant. I knock on their door. I investigate them to see, yes, they did or did not do something that is bad or illegal. And so they've had to go to more sort of extreme techniques. Now, the first step is generally, right, they need to find the actual hidden service. And so for that, right, they basically kind of have to get lucky, right? So if it's a hidden service, it's hard to find. They need to figure out some way of de-anonymizing that server. This is typically done through um, a misconfiguration, like maybe leaving uh, HTTP open on regular internet as well as Tor, and then somebody can connect to that, or by IP leakage through um, different de-anonymization techniques. And so once they found where the server is, right, the FBI finds a server, it's hosting illegal content, then what they do is they deploy a NIT to that server. And so a NIT is, an, is their term for network investigative technique, meaning there is some investigation that we need to do, it's on a network, right, so we have to invent a technique, right, to de-anonymize those people. Now, first one I'm going to talk about is 
uh, code from by HD Moore, right, in his Metasploit's decloaking engine. So this is really kind of a proof of concept of, well, how could we de-anonymize somebody um, that is on Tor using hidden services? How could we leak their IP address? And if you go and look for it, right, it's been taken down because it's not useful, but it was actually used. So this is, what, this is the first case that I worked at USA versus Cottom. Um, you can Google it if you really need to, but they de-anonymize a server located in Omaha, Nebraska, and they found that it was hosting illegal content, and so then they decided that they were going to deploy as many net techniques in order to de-anonymize the users of this um, server as they could. So there are three basic ones, right? We have SWF or Flash, we have Java, and then we have JavaScript, right? And so they would deploy the net using all of those different methods. And then they would also always try DNS, right? So if somebody wasn't smart enough to configure their DNS, right? They figured, well, maybe we can get a DNS leak, right? So they would always try that. And then I was given access to the servers that were modified, right? So they modified them to deploy this net, and then they gave us copies of these. And these are all uh, virtual servers. They're in, we're in VMware. Um, they were encrypted images, right, so that they were a little bit more difficult. All right, so hopefully this is legible from the back. If it's not, you're, there are lots of seats in the front, and you're more than welcome to come up here, but that may not happen. All right, so I'll use my pen here to hopefully um, draw some pictures. So one of the first things that we're going to see in here is this hex-encoded API key. Um, this is a, going to be a symmetric key that's going to be used to encrypt the, a blob of data, and we'll get to see what that blob is here in a second. It's going to encrypt it, and then the only way to decrypt it is going to, if you have that key. Now, Blowfish is symmetric, meaning you use the same key to encrypt as the key to decrypt. And so, we have this method here called generate cookie. It takes three different methods. It takes the key, which I just talked about. It takes a method, which is um, what manner are we de-anonymizing this user? And then a session ID. Right? And so for those of you who do web stuff, right, a session ID tracks the session of a particular user um, in a web browser. And so what it does is, and this is PHP code, it concatenates all of those together using some delimiters, right? So it's using at signs to delimit. And then we can also see that it's actually using a one here. And actually there are three different websites. And so you use one, two, three to denote which website was it that the user was visiting, right? So that they could look into that. And then we get down just a little bit farther and you're gonna see that it does use Blowfish to encrypt a message, right? Using a initialization vector and the data that was created on that line above. And at the bottom then, it also splits that into 40 uh, character chunks separated by dots, right? So that it kind of looks like something that's random. It's got 40 characters in length approximately. All right, and sorry, I should mention, this is all PHP code, right? So that gallery, that, that key is not visible to the user who visits the web page, right? So it's a hidden key that you don't have access to, because this is all in PHP. And again, in PHP, it goes ahead and fetches what the browser session or the session ID for the user is, and then using a couple of cases to decide, okay, when, what method should I try and deploy to anonymize this user? And again, it always uses DNS, but it tries to decide, am I gonna use JavaScript, Java, or Flash in order to do that? Because it knows that some of these work on certain platforms and some of them don't. And then for each one of the, the types of uh, methods, right, we saw that it calls generate key, right, so the method is the second item, so we got um, WS, SWF, and, and Java, right, I don't know why it's WS for JavaScript, but whatever, right, and it uses the session ID, and then the bottom is, okay, well, it decided that it's going to use SWF, and so it sets an ID in here, Right. Oh no, that's not what I wanted. To the cookie, S, the cookie for SWF, right? So I'm doing flash, 
and I'm going to go ahead and set that cookie in there. And then, so this is the reason that I was brought in, right? So when I was in the pretrial motion, we sat there for probably four hours describing how the source code for the exploit was lost. You can see the source code is not very long, right? But it got lost, right? They couldn't find it. They couldn't figure it out. And um, as a computer science major, as my bachelor's, my master's, and my doctorate, um, I had a lot of background, and when I went to Dakota State, I um, decided to specialize in reverse engineering. So I took a reverse engineering course with the Ida Pro book and Chris Eagle um, at Black Hat, and I started reversing stuff, and all of a sudden they came to me and they said, can you reverse engineer something? And I said, I suppose, right? So this is Flash, which is a little bit out of my wheelhouse, right? I was more in the assembly type of um, reverse engineering. And so I said, sure. And there is a, a decompiler for Flash called JPEX, which is the one that we use. And so um, one thing you'll notice in this source code, right, we don't have any comments, right, because comments, if you know anything about co compilation, right, comments get thrown out the window. Also variable names, right, so you'll see down here I got var loc, underscore loc1 and underscore loc2, right, it just picked random names for those variables. So again, that information is also lost. But what it would do is it would build a domain to make a connection to, which had a hard-coded IP address right there. And then this is the domain that it would connect to. And location one is that parameter that we just got. Right? So when it makes a DNS query, it has its own IP address. It has the domain that it's actually going to. And then we have embedded in the middle of that is a bunch of characters, which is our encrypted cookie right? that verifies who made the connection to the website. And then in this middle, on connect, right, if you can read it, again, that's really tiny text, but it's all of the code, so I put it all on here. There's information about what OS were they running, what CPU architecture are they running, and then what is that parameter, right? So when it makes a connection, it actually sends all of that information there, right? So if they only have DNS, then the bottom one will work, right? We'll get their IP address, right, from the DNS request. Otherwise, if it makes a successful one not getting the DNS, we'll still get information about what OS they're running, what architecture, um, and then what that session ID and all of that encrypted information is. And so our process was to uh, generate this um, flash code and then recompile it and make sure that it did work, right? That we, when we compiled it, we didn't see any significant uh, differences between what we compiled and what we reverse engineered. So, that gave us a pretty good idea that this was indeed the source code. And again, this is only, I don't know, 50 lines long, right? So it's not real hard in order to, to go and verify that that works. All right, so here's an example of the domain that it's gonna make a connection to. And as we can see in between this dot and this dot is the encrypted cookie that has been sent, right? And so it tries to make a connection. I went ahead and did this locally, right, so I can make sure that, yes, indeed, if it did a DNS connection, you'd get that cookie. And then, so on the back end, they were running the Twisted Python framework. Has anybody ever used Twisted for anything? No hands. So it's a, a framework that allows you to basically run any type of sort of server that you want and let you respond to different events and you can do it very quickly. So that's what the FBI um, used when they were running this in the back end. And they named it Cornhusker, clearly because we were in the Cornhusker state, so they thought, hey, what a great name, we can name it Cornhusker. Um, it, it does take in the shared key, right? So you guys saw the key earlier, that exact data is in the shared key.txt, right? And so it, just um, incorporated that as a, a command line parameter inside the server. So now what we're looking at is the actual server that when the FBI got a connection, right, they would, they wanted to log this information, right? And so there are a couple things that they had to do. At the top of this, we can see a policy request. So if anybody knows anything about Flash, if you're trying to make a connection to an outside entity, it may ask for a policy file saying what's allowed to be connected to. 
Again, we can see in here comments, right? Because this is actual code from the FBI. So if the browser made a policy request, it would oblige and give it a policy, right? So that it could make the connection. Otherwise, if it wasn't a policy request, which means we jump down here, it would go ahead and try and figure out, okay, is this a legitimate query to this, right? Because we have some encrypted text. We also have some keywords, right? We have, right, um, there's a C inside of the cookie, right? If we looked at the previous one, make sure that that character actually exists in there. And then we'll see this method down here, decrypt cookie. So decrypt cookie is gonna go ahead and try and take that cookie that we were given and using the symmetric key, right? So symmetric cryptography, you use the same key to encrypt as to decrypt. Right, so if they can decrypt it, then they'll look at the text and see, okay, is this a legitimate um, example? So, and then I have some of the command line output from doing this, right? You can see that it actually goes ahead and log all, logs all of this information. It logs it both to a database and to a log file. Um, I don't know why they decided to do both. I guess a database is probably easier because you can just run a SQL query against it. Ugh. And then here we can look and see they have a table, right? And they do a nice insertion statement on that table to go ahead and save it inside of the table so they have information about the client, what their IP address was, which is one of the key things, right? So once they have the IP address, then they go through the rest of the process. Oh, that, there we go. Okay. So we also have the DNS server, right? So I said that they will do DNS, right? And again, they go through and they basically take off the ends of it and then we should see, again, the decrypt cookie method, right? So they have one method in order to decrypt it no matter what way they use in order to de-anonymize the user. And so it's a little bit blown out on your screen. So this is the decrypt cookie one. Right, so it goes through and makes sure that the cookie is the right length, make sure that the cookie has the delimiters that it needs to have, right? It has to have a dollar sign in it, right? If you looked at our previous page, we had a dollar sign. We had um, the first part of that cookie was the number, right? The number tells you, okay, which website were they connecting to? And then the second two parts are going to be the type of method and then the session ID for that user. Right? And so if it couldn't decrypt it, right, it doesn't log it. So you can send garbage to the server, and if you didn't know what the key was, right, in all likelihood you're going to generate garbage on this, and so it's going to decrypt to nothing, and so you won't get a result from that. Okay, so some of the questions that we have were that um, how do we link that knit code, right? So I, you go to my website, I'm hosting... Um, bad things, right? So I send you a payload and you download that, but there also, right, it has to be a correlation if I make a connection back to you. And how do I prove that the person who downloaded the file was the person who ran that request, right? And that really boils down to time, right? So maybe I download the file and then I block out outgoing connections and then I send this data to another user and let them execute it and now they get to run it. Now, this is the theoretical, right, limitation, right? We, I didn't see in practice that somebody was doing this, but if you knew that it was there, then you could do things like monitor the traffic coming out of your network and block everything that's going out that's not going out over Tor, and then you would see that some NIT was trying to run, and you had the ability to do that. And that's one of the things that, how this got found, right? People found it in the wild, saying, hey, I saw that this was making an outbound connection. What do I need to do about that? And then the exploit, right, anybody, as we generally know, right, if you run an exploit against some box, right, anybody who receives that exploit has the ability to log that, and then they can use it for whatever their purposes were. Now, we're looking at flash code as an exploit, right, and the reason, right, this even works is that flash ignores the proxy settings set by the browser, right? So the browser says, okay, my proxy is gonna go through Tor, 
Flash sees that it's going to make this request out and it just ignores those, right? It makes a direct connection, which thus violates the property of Tor that you're not supposed to be able to figure out what your IP address is. So that was the um, first case that I did. And that was one operation that the FBI ran. And then subsequently there was um, another operation that they ran called Playpen. And again, this, there was a website that was hosting illegal content and they decided that they were going to try and de-anonymize the users. And the case that I worked was USA versus Michaud in um, Washington. And below here is, is my version of the diagram. And I have asked the FBI if this is correct. And they haven't said that it's not correct. They also haven't said that it is correct. right? So they can neither confirm nor deny that this is correct. But in general, right, what is going to happen is the FBI is going to generate some unique identifier for each user that wants to connect to that, to this, that is logged into the server. So one of the requirements was you had to be logged onto the server for this to um, get deployed. So they would generate a unique identifier and then they would take that unique identifier and they would embed it within the payload that they were sending to the user. So that way each user got a different version of the exploit. And after they had generated it, right, in theory, right, they logged this information. Now I'm guessing they logged it because they have, they say they have a database full of all of the unique identifiers. I haven't been given access to that code. And then what happens is that NIC code is pushed to the client. The client basically runs the, you, you know, the exploit leverages some vulnerability in the browser and starts executing the NIC code. What the NIC code does then is make a direct connection, right, thus bypassing all of Tor and connects to a government server. So it makes a direct TCP connection, right, with three-way handshakes. And then the, the government sees that information, logs that information, writes down what the IP address is, saves that to a hard disk, and then does some packet captures. So I wrote a declaration. I did um, a very limited amount of analysis for um, several different cases um, related to this out there. And it got published by the EFF and the ACLU in their guide to, to hacking, saying, okay, here are some of the issues that you need to, be, need to understand. Um, actually, in the Michelle case, which I, to my knowledge is the only case, they threw, out, threw it out because the FBI did not produce the exploit code. All the rest of the cases, the judges have said it was done in what was called good faith, and thus they are allowed to um, use that information that they have. So coverage, this is actually all over the world, right? So people from all over the world were using this. Off the top of my head, I think it was around 200,000 people logged on to the website during the three weeks that they were running it. Um, in the United States, there, I think, maybe a couple thousand have been from the United States, the rest were worldwide, and they've had 137 plus cases that are currently either were litigated or are in litigation within the United States. And so the evidence that they, the federal government provides is they provide the NIT code that they use. They provide a dead listing, right? So a dead listing is where you just start at the top and you just start disassembling all of the code and you spit it out. Well, that's not actually the source code which they claim it is because a dead listing, there's also data inside of the NIT code. And so you can argue that maybe that's not quite um, code, right? It's data within there. And then they also provide a PCAP showing um, just the single connection that the user made to the government site, showing what their public IP address is. And once they have that public IP address, right, they go to the ISP and they say, okay, who had this IP at this exact time? They'll go and do that lookup. And then they'll um, get a search warrant in order to search all of the digital devices that that person owns, right? Because they are charged with viewing, right, illegal material, which even receipt, meaning you get something, or viewing, right, is considered illegal um, when it comes to CP material. And then charges get filed, and then pre-motion, uh, pre-trial motions are generally where I come in. 
because this is, is evidence included or not included inside the case, right? And the judge makes that decision. And typically, if they say it's included, right, the person generally do, tries to do a plea bargain because that gives them a better uh, deal than if they try to go to court. So some of the issues that we have, so I don't know how many of you are under, uh, have heard of Rule 41 and the changes to Rule 41? Nobody? Okay, so Rule 41 basically talks about how a judge issues a warrant. Now, pre-internet, right, if I knew a crime took place in a certain location, like besides Iowa, right, I would know there's a judge who has a jurisdiction over that area so I can go to that judge and go ahead and get a warrant. But the change that they made, I think in 2016, was that now a judge can issue a warrant anywhere in the country in any jurisdiction. And that's to deal with this issue of Tor, right? So if, I'm going, if I know the server is in Virginia, how do I know who is gonna connect to that server, right? There are people, like I said, connecting all around the United States and all around the world, right? So they've changed this rule, so now, now you can issue a warrant anywhere. But this is one of the, the issues that is brought up in these cases is who has jurisdiction to issue that warrant. Did the judge, there was one judge who issued it in Virginia, did he have jurisdiction in order to issue that warrant, yes or no? So, and generally they say yes, you did have, he did have jurisdiction to issue a warrant for the entire United States. We also have Fourth Amendment issues, so illegal search and seizure. So here are some questions, right? So is the IP, is your IP address public? Right, should anybody be able to know? Well, right, you can argue yes and no, right? That's kind of up for debate. The other stuff, right? Is your MAC address public? Is your username public? Is the architecture on your computer public, right? So generally, like, we think of those things as not being public things, but they were things that were collected, right? And that was, those are all listed inside of the search warrant to say you are allowed to collect these five things, and that is it, right? You're not allowed to collect anything else other than that. And then testing, right? So, so with these cases, right, I haven't been able to test any of the code except for the NIT. Right, so they gave me the NIT, the part that goes ahead and figures out what their MAC address is, what their username is, um, what OS they're running on, right, and then it makes a connection out. Right, so I, I can test that, but they haven't released the um, FBI, has not released the exploit code, and one of the agents said that um, he tested it on his home computer and it did not make any changes to his security settings. Right, he ran one test. Right, to see if it worked, right? Is that gonna to apply to every single computer? How would I know, right? I'm not allowed to test it, right? I don't have access to that. And some of the, the legal questions are, is there a known error rate for the exploit running, right? Yes or no, we don't know what that is. Um, are the unique identifiers unique, right? So if you issued the same unique identifier to a bunch of people, you might attribute access that was not, maybe the person accessed it once versus access it 20 times. Right, and that sort of impacts what the sentencing is that you can get for that. And again, none of the server software was included, so I, I can test that to verify it. So one of the things that I proposed, and I really doubt that the FBI is going to agree with me on, is that we should have a framework for deciding how we actually test this software, right? They're, going, they're not gonna stop using NITs to de-anonymize users, and so, if you think about it, right, the entire system setup should be something that's included, right? Now, that could be a virtual machine that has all of the software that they used when they deployed it, or it could be that they specify, okay, here's the OS that we were running, here's the patches, here's the configuration files that we modified in order to get it up to the stage. Um, all log files, right, who had access to that, right? Did an agent have access to that and have the ability to add additional entries of somebody he didn't like inside of there? Yes or no, right? Again, things that I really can't verify. And then all the source code that they have and then different testing procedures for exactly how do you test your code and make sure that it does work or doesn't work? What situations would it break in? Right? So those are, are things that are key when, you, when you're actually going through the legal process. All right, so any questions? I kind of talk fast, clearly. And <laughs> we started early, so. Didn't help that. So just so I understand correctly, like the end goal here, the, the, the information that they're using to link the individual was the public IP address, right? Whatever was on their edge. Is that correct? 
Yes, so whatever their public IP address was. And it couldn't go any deeper than that. There, were, there wasn't no additional entropy across the heuristics that went deeper beyond that public IP. Yeah, so the search warrant very specifically told them, right, they went and asked, right, they, they're the FBI, so they're the one issuing the, right. the warrant in the first place and getting a judge to sign it. Um, and so they very specifically said, okay, here's the information we want to collect, and they had to give a reason why do you want to collect that. And the reasoning is, well, we need the IP address so that we know whose door to knock on, right? And then the additional information, so if you have multiple people inside of a house, okay, which computer is it? Well, I mean, their basic idea is to get low-hanging fruit, right? And a lot of the people, right? So if you were blocking all outgoing connections that outside of Tor, right, this wouldn't work. Yeah, so there are lots of ways that you could get around this, but this will definitely catch all of the low-hanging fruit of people who downloaded the, the Tor browser bundle and just hit, hit run, right? That's what it's going to catch. And they're like, oh, I want JavaScript, right? So they enable JavaScript. And, yeah, so one of the things, right, Flash was not something that was a default thing, right? You're supposed to disable Flash if you're using the Tor browser, and in the first case, that's what they were using for the, the, the client that I was working for was using. Other questions? I do have some references, but you know, I'll post the slides. All of the stuff I talked about here is the, the stuff that's publicly available. They, so when you work on one of these cases, they also will give you a, it's not a non-disclosure agreement. Um, they'll give you an agreement that you have to sign to say that you will not talk about um, information that you've received, you will not disseminate it, you only talk with the lawyer and the, the, their team. So, so I, all the stuff I put in here, again, is public stuff, right? There's other stuff where the actual code, right, that they give me, right, clearly I can't share that with you until they decide that that's something that's publicly available. Anything else? That's it.